These are the top 11 questions that I get asked all the time about finasteride. Will minoxidil or Rogaine work the same as finasteride? Can I use a different medical therapy as an alternative to finasteride? Rogaine and finasteride are not interchangeable. They have different mechanisms of action. Finasteride does more to prevent the loss of your hair, whereas minoxidil is great at increasing the fullness of your hair. And that is why minoxidil and finasteride are complementary to one another and are often used as first-line medical therapy. And when you look at all the other medical therapies available, such as low-level laser light therapy, PRP, and microneedling, for example, none of them are an exact replacement for finasteride. All of them work to stimulate and to increase fullness of your hairs, rather than truly working on the basic mechanism of preserving hair by reducing levels of DHT. The only option for reducing those levels in an appreciable way is finasteride. There are of course some supplementations that may do something similar to finasteride, but none as potent as finasteride or its cousin dutasteride. So in other words, none of these other medical therapies delay the further loss of your hair. And that's something that's really important to realize. What is the safest dose of finasteride? Well, the standard dose is one milligram per day. And that's the dose that we start all of our patients on. Some patients have concerns about potential side effects and they ask to be started on a lower dose. Now, lower doses are possible, but they're less effective. It does diminish the potential risk of side effects, but just realize that it's also a less effective option for hair preservation. I had good results on finasteride, but then my hair started to fall out. What do I do now? The first step that I recommend taking is to switch from a generic form of finasteride to the brand name Propecia. Sometimes Propecia is just made in a more reproducible, consistent way, and the way that it gets absorbed into the body is also more consistent, and that can lead to better results. So anytime someone's been on finasteride for a long time and it seems like it's no longer helping, then we switch over to Propecia first and see what impact that has over the course of say six months. If that doesn't help or the patient doesn't want to spend more money on Propecia or just isn't interested in trying it, then we consider bumping up to Dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams per day. This medication is a more potent form of finasteride. Dutasteride is approved in South Korea by by their version of the FDA, but keep in mind it's not approved by the FDA here in the United States for treating androgenic alopecia. So it is used off-label for that purpose. Also keep in mind that with dutasteride, it is a more effective method of preserving your hair. However, the side effect profile is worse. So your risk of developing side effects, including sexual side effects, is about twice as much with dutasteride compared to finasteride. And for many people, that increased risk just isn't worth it. Where can I get finasteride? Finasteride is a prescription medication, so you need a doctor to prescribe it and to send it typically to your local pharmacy. We've been working on an online platform that allows you to get your prescriptions shipped to your door, and you can find out more at feelconfident.com. We've been able to bring the price down and offer it at a lower price than many of the other online platforms, and it's an easy way to get the medication directly to your door. I always recommend that people compare the price of what it costs to be on finasteride from their local pharmacy compared to feel confident or one of the other online platforms to find out about this lower cost solution head to feelconfident.com if i'm getting a hair transplant do i have to be on finasteride it depends but usually the answer is yes when you have a significant amount of hair in the dht sensitive zone which for most people is like all of this you want to preserve that hair and you shouldn't rely on transplant surgery alone to restore all of it if you lose all of that hair. So when we're working with patients who have a lot of hair in this entire zone and there's just
just say some hairline work that we're trying to do with the transplant, just as an example. The transplant will help bring fresh hair into that location, but it's not going to do anything to preserve the existing hair in the vicinity. For that hair, you need medical therapy, and the most potent, as we've spoken about, is going to be finasteride at preserving that hair. So I always talk about having a stable foundation on which to then build. The medical therapy gives you that foundation, and then the surgery allows you to build. Also, keep in mind that finasteride can help with preserving your donor supply. So it's not just the DHT sensitive zone where you have hair that's susceptible to loss. There are also portions of the potential donor area, in the back and the sides of the head, where you can continue to see some loss over time. And if you're taking those grafts and you're transplanting those grafts over to say the frontal scalp or the mid scalp, those grafts are then susceptible to some degree of loss over time. So when you're taking finasteride, you're also protecting the donor area as well. Oftentimes people forget this and as we've moved from FUT surgery to more and more FUE surgery it's more critical than ever to consider preserving that donor area because when you do a transplant and you do an FUE procedure you're harvesting broadly so that you don't over harvest a specific area and make it look more bald and as you're harvesting broadly some of that hair is outside of the traditional safe zone and that's why you really want to keep that in mind when getting a hair transplant. Is finasteride only helpful with the recipient area? No, as I mentioned previously, it can be great at again preserving the donor area and keeping it strong, especially in people who are susceptible to retrograde alopecia or to an expanding crown. Both of those phenomenon can actually shrink down the potential donor area from which you can get the grafts that you're going to be transplanting to the new location. What do I do if I develop side effects from finasteride? Step number one is to stop the medication. I don't believe in continuing to use it despite having side effects. Step two is report it to your prescribing doctor. You know, this is a prescription medication, so you have to have gotten it from someone to talk to your doctor about what you're experiencing to see if the side effects can be linked to the finasteride, because if they can, then it's better to stop the drug. Step three is once you've stopped the medication, and you've given enough time for your symptoms to resolve, then you can consider restarting the finasteride at a lower dose. And what that usually means, at least in my practice, is going down to 0.5 milligrams, which is about half a tablet every third day. So you reduce the dose and you reduce the frequency as well. And that usually leads to people being able to tolerate the medication, but also not having side effects. Now, in some patients, the symptoms persist even on low dose finasteride. So if that happens, then I recommend trying out a topical formulation of finasteride. For example, a 0.3% solution of topical finasteride. It's not going to be as effective at hair preservation. It will also have fewer side effects. And for many people, no side effects. How dangerous is finasteride for mental health? This is a controversial topic. Some studies and some people will purport increased depression risk due to the dysfunction of the dopaminergic system. And some suggest other mechanisms that are summarized in this chart. But there are inconsistent findings in the literature. But I think it is important to consider a history of depression in patients who are going to be started on finasteride. And I think people need to understand that their depression can potentially worsen with the use of finasteride, even if we don't fully understand the underlying mechanisms. The best paper that I found on this topic is linked in the description below. Does finasteride increase your risk of prostate cancer? The answer is no, as far as we know in 2023. Now, there were some early concerns regarding an association between the use of finasteride and increased risk of high-grade prostate cancer, and that has not been borne out in more recent follow-up studies. And you can check out the New England Journal of of medicine article with updated information in 
the description below. How long do I need to be on finasteride? Now, keep in mind, this is a long-term commitment. It's not like you get on finasteride for a year, try it out and just stop it because you didn't see any changes. Actually, if you don't see any progressive loss of your hair, that's a good thing. That means the medication is doing something. But oftentimes people get on finasteride expecting their hair to look more full or to regrow the hair that they used to have. And that's not often what happens. Basically, whatever you're left with, you're trying to lock into place with the finasteride, not regrow hair that you've already lost. That can happen to a degree with finasteride, but often isn't the case. So it really is like a long-term commitment. Keep in mind, we lose the majority of our hair. The accelerated phase of androgenic alopecia is about mid-20s, late 20s, into early 30s. So once you're out of that time frame, your hair loss is going to progress much slower. So there are some people who are on finasteride in their 20s, 30s, and then maybe even into their 40s. But by the time they reach 50s, 60s, they might start to see their more long-term pattern of hair, and they might have a very slow continued loss. And the amount of hair that they are losing might significantly slow down. So at that point, some people decide to come off of finasteride and see what happens after they've been on it for potentially decades. Can can women take finasteride? The answer is sometimes. We want to avoid finasteride in patients who are premenopausal and who might get pregnant. We also want to avoid finasteride in pregnancy. Finasteride can lead to birth defects in a male fetus, but finasteride may be an option in postmenopausal women and for women who don't plan on having children. However, finasteride should be prescribed with caution for women who have a history of breast cancer. I'm on finasteride, but my wife and I are planning on having a baby. Should I stop taking it? Yes, finasteride, even at low doses, can potentially cause a reduction in sperm counts in some men. So I recommend stopping for at least a few months while trying to conceive just to play it safe.